As we continue to remember, you know, that Scripture is our authority, it is shaping, it is creating, it is doing something, it is meant to be authoritative. As we continue to look together at what it means to be the church, this is the reality that I keep trying to push on you. Inevitably, as we keep doing this, we are going to run into things that as solid and as sound as we're trying to be, there's places where we're not lined up with Scripture. Um, there's places that will, there will inevitably come thoughts and ideas and practices and traditions and things that are not lining up. So repentance is crucial and it's significant and it's powerful. It is what lines us up. It is what brings us back. And it is what brings us refreshing. Let me put it to you this way. The major driver of sanctification in the Christian life is the constant course correction that is ongoing repentance. That's a lot of church words in there, so that, that's the whole message in a sentence, but we're going to explain it. But that's a lot of church words in there, um, but I heard a pastor here recently say, he was preaching on sanctification, and he was preaching on, um, oh, what's the other word? Um, propitiation. He was preaching on those kinds of topics, and he says, I know that's a lot of church words, but I've heard you order at Starbucks. <laughs> if you can get that, then we can get this. I thought that was funny. Um, but So here's the simplified version. Repentance is how we move from glory to glory, to greater glory. You've never heard me preach that message before, but 2 Corinthians 3 moves us from glory, a kind of lesser glory, to glory to greater glory, right? Um, repentance is the primary way we mature in Christ. That's in Ephesians 4. Um, true repentance brings about a refreshing from God that empowers a couple of things, a greater hatred of sin and a greater eagerness for holy living. That's 2 Corinthians 7. We'll probably look at that next week. So with that promise and with all that on the line, I'm just asking, are you in? And I hope you are. All of this, I will remind, means that repentance has to be something different than what we usually think of when we hear the word. Repentance cannot only be that sort of occasional, dramatic, emotional, uh, dividing line kind of experience that we associate with the end of a church service or a revival old-fashioned revivals that I don't know if we do those anymore. Sometimes it is just that. Repentance is just that, but it is more than that. John MacArthur is a very sound teacher, and he says repentance is a complete change, and it begins at salvation, and that starts a permanent, lifelong process of ongoing confession of sin. Just as we believe in order to be saved, but then continue believing throughout the Christian life, so also our initial repentance marks the beginning of a life of repentance as we seek to live for God. It's very similar to Colossians 2.6 that says, just as you received Christ Jesus as Lord, continue to live your lives in him. So after our initial repentance, after we get saved, true repentance is an everyday, lived out, and actually refreshing, this is the part that I think that we don't quite get, we'll get there, it's a everyday, lived out, and refreshing reality. That's what repentance is. It is the constant course correction that realigns us. So we're going to look at it again, and we're going to just keep hitting at this at different angles, and we're going to get there uh, over the next several weeks. So in Acts chapter 3 is this great story. I don't have time to tell you the whole thing. Um, but basically it's a healing. And Peter looks at the guy and he says, I don't have any silver or gold that you're expecting, but what I have, I give. In the name of Jesus, rise up. And he heals him. And that healing, not surprisingly, creates a lot of attention. Like if I were to be able to go into the hospital and just look at somebody and say, uh, yeah, you don't have cancer anymore get up, you're healed. That would get the attention of all the nurses and doctors and there would be an audience, which is what Peter has. So verse 11, that's what's going on. While the man, who is healed, 
held on to Peter and John, all the people were astonished and came running to them in the place called Solomon's Colonnade. When Peter saw this, he said to them, fellow Israelites, why does this surprise you? Why do you stare at us as if by our own power or godliness we had made this man walk? The God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, the God of our fathers, has glorified his servant Jesus. By faith in the name of Jesus, this man whom you see and know was made strong. It is Jesus' name and the faith that comes through him that has completely healed him, as you can all see. Every miracle story that you read in the Bible, I don't care who you are, our first instant, instinct is to look at the miracle because we want to figure out the mechanics of the miracle. We want to figure out, can I get that for myself? Can I do that? Can I have my miracle? And it's all really because what we want is relief. But Luke and other biblical writers are always inviting us to remember the source of the miracle. In this case, Jesus. So look at what Peter says about Jesus. You handed Jesus over to be killed, and you had disowned Jesus before Pilate, though he had decided to let him go. You disowned the Holy and Righteous One and asked that a murderer be released to you. Listen to the beauty of this sentence from a sermon. You killed the author of life, but God raised him from the dead. We are witnesses of this. You killed the author of life. That doesn't even sound possible. But the evil of man is such that it is. And we did it. The Jews demanded that Pilate kill the author of life while at the same time demanding that he save the life of a murderer. I put the whole thing on Facebook yesterday, but this is John MacArthur again. People want to hold on to their sin while having it conveniently forgiven. That's not repentance, not at all. He says, you killed the author of life. You traded the holy and righteous one for a murderer. So recognize that's us. Recognize you traded, I traded the holy and righteous one. I traded Jesus for, go ahead and fill in your own blank. I traded Jesus for a little bit of what I thought would be happiness. I traded Jesus for thrill. I traded Jesus for, you can fill in your own blank. Don't we all regularly find ourselves trading Jesus for something else? Something you want more than him, something you think will make you happier than him, something that you can't seem to keep yourself from falling into? So let's go back to the questions from last week. What are you going to trust about God? Here's the devastating reality. <laughs> if, if, if Jesus is the Son of God, can we agree that? Yeah, yeah. If he is the author of life, we can agree on that, yeah. Everything that you know about Jesus, trading him for X is, is just devastating. Here's another quote. In light of the fact that the Israelites freed a murderer and killed the author of life, and in light of the fact that Jesus is the fulfillment of God's plan of redemption witnessed to by the Old Testament prophets, those Israelites must repent and turn to Christ to be saved. To do anything other than repent would be utterly nonsensical. If we really remember who he is, every time we trade on him, we have to go, oh my, what did I do? There is no sinning and just kind of walking along and, and treating it like it's nothing if you actually remember who he is, which is why we so conveniently forget who he is often. We'll get there. In fact, that's, that's the second question. What do we want to trust about God? What do we do with our sin? 
Verse 17. Now, fellow Israelites, I know that you acted in ignorance, as did your leaders. A little bit of an out. But this is how God fulfilled what he had foretold through all the prophets, saying that his Messiah would suffer. Verse 19. Repent then and turn, or return, or turn again to God, so that your sins may be wiped out, that times, notice that plural, that times of refreshing may come from the Lord and that he may send the Messiah who has been appointed for you, even Jesus. I had to repent in that verse. What am I going to trust about God? Do you actually believe what you, I just read you? <laughs> Can you believe that repentance is a gift? Have you ever once when you've done something that you wish you hadn't done, when you stepped over the line again, have you ever once thought to yourself, oh, I can't, I, I can't wait to bring this to God because he's going to refresh me. That's not what we do. So that's not what we believe. In other words, that verse makes me repent of my repentance. The uh, Puritans had a saying that even the tears of repentance have to be washed in the blood of Christ. So do you believe that repentance will bring refreshing? No. <laughs> Not really. It doesn't make sense. How, I mean, I don't want to put you there for too long, but I mean, just remember how you feel when you've done it again, when you've, when you've, broken this again, when you've, you've lost your temper again, when you've said something again, just that feeling of shame and negativity and guilt, how in the world does that become refreshing? If I'm going to repent, I'm going to have to first repent of what I don't yet trust about God, which is, <laughs> look at it, what are you going to do, <clears throat> let's just think about it, what are you going to do with your sin? What do we typically do with our sin? This is where you talk back to me. What do we typically do with our sin? Justify it. Bury Hadn't thought of that one. What? Bury it. Bury it. Oh my gosh, yes. Didn't happen. Just kind of justify and minimize. Just kind of go on and, for, and and forget that it's really there. What'd you say? Oh, just along with justify and minimize. Minimize. Oh my gosh, yes. Not that bad. I didn't kill anybody. <laughs> right? Hide it. Didn't happen. Ignore. Ignore. Deny. Deny. Oh, man. I didn't do anything else. Y'all are preaching now, as my good. pastor used to say. I'm still a good person. <laughs> yeah, uh, yeah. Deflect. Yeah. Deflect. Some people share it. Some people share it. Like Eve. Okay. Okay. Yeah, misery loves company. <laughs> I like it. I do like it. Here's where repentance plays out. What are you going to do with your sin? Did you hear Peter's answer? Return to God. <laughs> so let's put all this together in one really ugly sentence. Not really ugly. Kind of ugly, but also beautiful. You'll, you'll hear it. Return to the one who at extraordinary cost gave the Jesus you just traded. That's what Peter says is the answer to our sin. Return to God. Why is it so hard to go back to the person that you've wounded? When, when I've hurt her, when I've hurt my kids, especially in a really close relationship, why is it so hard to go back to the one that you wounded? Shame. Shame. Pride. Pride. Yeah. Yeah. 
you know that just saying I'm sorry or asking forgiveness <coughs> is not enough? Sure. Fear. Fear. Big time. It takes a lot of humility to go to somebody that you have wounded and say, I was wrong. This was so stupid. I'm, I am so sorry. And even before you get to that conversation, you've already played it in your head. And so here's the other thing that you didn't mention, but I, you, you probably have thought of, and that is, what if they don't forgive? What if the relationship is irretrievably damaged? What if all this costs me far more than I thought it was going to? What if my repentance is rejected? But we know differently about God, don't we? Or do we? What are you going to trust about God? Peter says return to him. So we have to answer questions like, is he a place that I can bring my sin? How many times can I bring this to him before he finally gives up on me? What if this time is too much? I wrote the sentence, is it safe to bring sin to God? And immediately thought of uh, Mr. Beaver from uh, The Lion, the Witch, and the Wardrobe. You've heard the quote before. Um, Mr. Beaver is explaining to Susan, Aslan is a lion, the lion, the great lion. Ooh, said Susan, I thought he was a man. Is he quite safe? I shall feel rather nervous about meeting a lion. Safe, said Mr. Beaver. Who said anything about safe? Of course he isn't safe. But he's good. He's the king, I tell you. If we really believe that, we go back to him. Even though he's the one we wounded. Even though he's... There's so many messages in my head that I've got to keep focusing. Um, Peter already answered the question earlier. Verse 16, we read it. By faith in the name of Jesus, this man whom you see and know was made strong. It is in Jesus' name that the faith that comes through him that has completely healed him. So Peter's whole point here is not the miracle. It's never about the miracle. His whole point is just as Jesus healed this man of his physical problem, that is how, or, or sorry, you can be healed and forgiven of your sin problem by the same Jesus. If we trust that about God, we will return to him. We will bring the sin we just traded for him to him. And of course that's ugly. Of course that's gross. Of course that's difficult. But that's where the refreshing comes from. Hang with me for just a couple more minutes. It's also not just refreshing that comes out of repentance. If you read the rest of verse 19, it says this, return to God in repentance, the times of refreshing may come from the Lord, and that God would send Jesus who has been appointed for you. And he goes on from there. Um, but appointed actually means heralded beforehand. In other words, return to Jesus and times of refreshing will come and Jesus will come because he was appointed for this. Crucified before the foundation of the world, Revelation 13, so that you and I who were chosen before the foundation of the world, Ephesians 1, would be made holy and blameless in his sight, Ephesians 1. Return to God. So, we've done it. <laughs> And we've decided we're not going to believe the lie about God that says he's going to reject us. We're not going to believe the lie about God that says he's going to beat us down. We've, we're just, we're going to bring it in all of our shame and all of our sadness and all of our whatever. We're going to bring it. We're going to return to God and we're going to say, I'm sorry. We're going to bring him that humility. And let's just call, for the simplicity of it, let's just call his side grace. He receives that. He he was appointed for that. That's another, it's a, a, a focus, Jim. He was appointed 
for that. Before, do you understand that before the foundation of the world, the thing that you are so ashamed of was provided for? That, what, what does that level of grace produce in us? I'll just answer for you gratitude. And, and okay, what if it's not enough gratitude? Could it ever be enough gratitude? What, what if me going back to God and saying, I did it again, I'm sorry, what if it doesn't move my emotional needle at all? Are, are, are you really telling me that if, if it moved your emotional needle, needle this much, that that's enough? I mean, I'm not saying we need to, you know, we need to plow up the fallow ground so that our hearts are, 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 are tender again. But, but don't get caught there because I don't feel sorry enough. Just return to God. Just return to God. What are you going to trust about him? What will you do with that sin? Are you, are you at least seeing how this is supposed to work? I'm going to, I'm going to wrap it up because I don't even know what time it is, but I'm sure I've, I'm, I'm on. But something like humility toward God is met by grace that creates gratitude, that creates worship, that creates refreshing. That's where it comes from. You receive no refreshing by hiding your sin. You receive no refreshing by denying your sin, minimizing your sin, justifying your sin, all those other things that you mentioned. But the word of God promises if we will go against what we say, what we think would be normal, and go back to the one that we hurt, Scripture promises that we will receive grace from that grace, gratitude, worship, refreshing. The word actually means to breathe again. Can't help believing that that has something to do with Holy Spirit. Meanwhile, two realities are happening through this process of repenting and turning to God. We are affirming the truth about God versus the lie. We were affirming that he is the place to bring our sin. We are affirming that he is sufficient. And we are being sanctified by the truth. John 14 through 17. So let me just wrap this up with a practical example. Um, like I said, we're going to keep running at this thing from different angles, uh, mostly because the biblical reality of repentance is so much different than we think. Um, and that what we grew up with. Today, I'm trying to help us repent of what we have often believed about repentance. There's another aspect of returning to God, and that is just return to following him. <laughs> and we'll get there. But this was important, um, to just return to him. So let me just try to, to give a practical example. Uh, I've told the story before, but um, it's been a while, and um, it, it's fairly short. <laughs> um, my mom, um, we just came through Mother's Day. I've been thinking about my mom a lot. She's been gone for six and a half years. And um, very godly woman, very godly woman. Uh, as far as I know, there are only four people who have ever called my mom Rosie. My mom's name was Rosemarie, is Rosemarie. Um, and my dad called her Rosie. Um, my grandparents, I think I remember them calling her Rosie. And God called her Rosie. My mom tells the story of she was laying on the couch, which was very unusual for my mom. Uh, but she says she was laying on the couch and she was thinking things she shouldn't. And she never said what that was. Knowing my mom, it's something that would probably be really, really tame compared to the standards of the ridiculous, stupid things I've done. You know. But I don't know what it was. But she was thinking things she shouldn't think. And she said as clear as day, as audible a voice, and she was alone in the house, she heard an audible voice say, Rosie. And she, she, she knew that it was God. She knew that it was a, a, a moment of repentance. She knew that this is wrong. I, I'm, I'm thinking this thing and I shouldn't be thinking this thing, Rosie. And she prayed and she repented and, and she, 
she just kind of gave it to God. In that moment of trading Jesus for something that she thought was better, she was brought to conviction by the simple calling of her name. And so in humility, she brought it to him, and she found forgiveness. And she found grace, because that's what we find in times of need, according to Hebrews. <clears throat> she found forgiveness. She found grace. She did, according to her story, begin to, to thank God and to praise God. And she received refreshing do you know how I know she received refreshing? Because she told me the story. And because of the way that she described the voice. The voice didn't hammer her. The voice didn't beat her over the head. The voice didn't shame her. She was already ashamed. <laughs> If, if I could add parentheses, I don't know how she experienced hearing God. When I hear God, it's sometimes just an impression and it's just a single word or it's a little tiny phrase, but it's so packed with meaning that it's like the whole thing comes with this massive parentheses behind it. <clears throat> so if I could fill in the parentheses, God said, Rosie, that's, that's not what you need to be about. You're my daughter. This is not you. I love you. Would, you. would you give that to me? And would you just ask me for forgiveness? And would you receive my forgiveness and my grace? And can we just kind of hang out together for just a little bit here? I don't know if that speaks to you or not, but that's what we're looking for. That's I'll go back to something I said before, and that is that repentance is not just that occasional, emotional, yada yada thing that's associated with the end of a church service. Repentance is actually daily. Daily aligning ourselves again with him. Daily bringing anything and everything that we have done wrong to him. Right back to him right back to the one that we traded on. Refreshing comes in a lot of different forms. And he's in charge of it. So I don't want us to get into the habit of, you know, well, I've confessed and, I, I, and nothing happened. Okay. Keep doing it. Keep crying out. Father, um, I just thank you for such a powerful promise. <clears throat> Such a counterintuitive thing to do. To return to you who we gave away, who we sinned against. Psalm 51. David says, against you and you alone have I sinned, because he understood that before we break a law, we stab you in the heart. Before we sin, we, we break relationship, or, or eh, I'm not saying it right. I just thank you for such a powerful promise. Help us live in that reality. I, I want to be one who repents quickly, easily, even. Not flippantly, but easily. That, that it's my go-to for everything. I, I want us to be people that model that and exhibit that freedom to return to you so that times of refreshing may come and so that you would send a fresh experience of Jesus who is appointed 
for the very thing that we are bringing to you. What a powerful promise. I just want everybody to live in the, in, in the reality of that. I pray that in Jesus' name.